Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me, you guys. I'm so excited to be in Charleston. It's so beautiful. Um, so yes, I work with creative entrepreneurs, and that's what I've been doing for the past five years professionally. And I've gotten to work with a lot of writers and bloggers and designers, developers, coaches, consultants, photographers, artists. And one of the things that they all have in common, whether they're publishing content or not, though I work with a lot of people who are publishing content, is they want bigger audiences. They want more focus and time and energy to create what they really want to be creating. And they want better opportunities, partnerships, and collaborations. So today I'm going to share with you a few of my best tips and tactics that I've used to get bigger, more, and better in my own blogging and content sharing life. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Now, the story begins with Mount Everest. <laughs> in 2010, I became obsessed with Mount Everest. It started with a show on the Discovery Channel that I stumbled across called Everest, like beyond the limits. There was something dramatic like that. And I knew that Mount Everest was the tallest mountain in the world, but I had no idea what a feat it was to get up to the top and then back down alive. And so I became completely captivated by the topic of Mount Everest. I started consuming every single book and documentary out there. Do any of you guys ever get like this on topics? Like that was Mount Everest for me. And um, yeah, I just became completely obsessed. Now hold on that, because at the same time, I also had a small personal blog and I was growing a following, like whenever I expected that maybe only my mom would read it, I started getting comments from strangers. Do any of you guys remember the first time that happened? And you're like, what? Other people are reading my stuff. It especially happened whenever I painted my hallway in black and white stripes, which took a fine arts major, that would be me, and an electrical engineer, that would be my husband, to really figure out. Um, and this was pre-Pinterest, so I know that this might look pretty standard to you all right now, but it was a big deal at the time. I was also photographing what I was wearing on the daily, and I was also blogging about things like what I was cooking, and I was following a lot of home blogs at the time who were talking about how they clean their sinks, so I tried that on for size two. I was just trying to blog about a lot of different things, and I knew that I loved blogging, but I didn't really quite have a point of view or really know what it was that I wanted to say. So the first blogging conference that I ever went to, which was probably five or six years ago, I remember practically introducing myself as, hi, I'm Kathleen, but I'm not a big deal. Don't even worry about who I am. It's no big deal. <laughs> I like should have put it on my name tag. I'm Kathleen and I'm no big deal. And the thing is, is that I was surrounded by really big deals. Like I was still blogging under a .blogspot domain and they all had .coms and they had sponsors and they had a huge following. Again, this was maybe even before Instagram got really big, but they were like the thousands and thousands of kinds of followers people. Anyway, so I knew that I loved blogging, and whenever I would go to this conference, I went a few years in a row, I always left with this pressure of like, how am I going to make money writing? How can I do that? So back to Mount Everest, I decided that I was going to pause on stressing about getting sponsors. Like everyone at the time was working with Old Navy and Land of Nod and all these amazing people and I just decided to forget about it. Instead, I decided to quit my day job working as a senior art director in advertising. I decided to gather some gear and get some immunizations and go to Nepal. I wanted to see Mount Everest with my own eyeballs. So, I did. I even got an email from the US government about a week before I left that asked me not to go. They were like, we don't think it's a good idea. 
So I emailed the Brits that I was traveling with, and I was like, what do you think? And they were like, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's no big deal. So I spent almost a month hiking through the Himalayas, and I um, flew into the most dangerous airport in the world. Let me see if I have a picture of it here. No. Okay, that picture's gone. But I flew into the most dangerous airport in the world. In fact, if you Google most dangerous airport in the world, you will see videos of the airport that I flew into. So going from Kathmandu, Nepal, to Lukla, Nepal, which is where the trailhead for hiking to Mount Everest Base Camp starts, um, there's what's called a short takeoff landing strip. Right before I had made this trip myself, the, the strip had finally been paved. It had been dirt up until that point. And it was like on the side of a mountain. And a month before I left, there was a deadly crash going into this airport. So it was almost a deal breaker. I, was, I didn't have kids at the time, <laughs> Fortuna fortunately. I don't think I would have done it. I was terrified, in other words. And... Um, you know, it's so funny because on that actual flight, I remember looking at the pilots, like they were practically sticking their head out the window to like navigate around these huge majestic mountains. But we landed and honestly, the landing was a lot more smooth than it was yesterday into Charleston. <laughs> and I've never been afraid of flying ever since. And so I got a hike for 14 days straight with yaks. I feel like I took a photo of every single yak on the trail, and that was a lot of yaks. And then, after 14 days, I got to watch the sunrise behind Mount Everest from the top of Kala Pitar, which is another mountain, 18,500 feet altitude. And um, at this point, I wasn't even eating. I was like so altitude sick, I couldn't eat. And it was the adventure of a lifetime. So then I came home and I blogged about it. So again, I had just quit my day job in advertising. I didn't have a lot of freelance clients yet. And so I was able to dedicate all of my time to this story. Now, I don't know if having a blog was the catalyst for wanting to tell this great story. Like, I need to have something to blog about, so I might as well go across the world and fly into the most dangerous airport in the world and blog about it. Or if I was blogging about it so much because it was just such a captivating and transformative experience for me. And I think the truth is, it was a little bit of both. So what I wanna ask you today is, where would you go if you weren't afraid? And what do you really want to talk about? And how could you be a little bit more brave? Now, I'm not asking you guys to go to Mount Everest. And in fact, I want to tell you that one of my bravest pieces of content was, in fact, a smaller detail. It was about my armpits. <laughs> Did any of you guys get freaked out about aluminum in your deodorant a few years ago? Can I see some hands? Like, okay, so me too. And I was on the hunt because the thing is, is that I don't naturally smell like roses. Like I smell more like Taco Bell at 2 a.m. naturally. And I'll like wake up like that. I don't understand. And it's like my husband, it's no smell. Like he smells like roses. So <laughs> I needed to find something that actually worked that didn't have all the aluminum in it. Um, so I decided to also blog about that. The oversharer I am tried out a bunch of different things and I blogged about it and I was surprised whenever I got something like 200 comments. It was insane. And to this day, people are still asking me what works and what doesn't. I have people sending me deodorant in the mail. <laughs> now, and I'll tell you what works after the talk. If you save, save your questions, <laughs> the important ones, like about my armpits. Um, now, I didn't mean to position myself as an armpit connoisseur by any means. But what I learned from this experience is that whenever you can get really honest in the big adventures and in the little details, it completely resonates. And now at this time, 
I had started my company, Braid Creative, and I also learned that being who I am and sharing the honest stories from the big adventures to the little details, it wasn't unprofessional. In fact, I think I was closing more deals just by being who I was. So my tip number one for getting that bigger audience and more traffic and better opportunities is to make really honest content. Because what's real is what resonates. So again, that can be about the big adventures, you can be bold, but a lot of that happens in those little details. I think it was Annie Lamott that talks about having that letter-sized sheet of paper and cutting out a one-inch square in the middle. And if you can look at the details of what you're writing about through that one-inch square, you can get really deep and really honest. Now, I'm an oversharer, obviously. Being honest does not mean that you have to overshare. I naturally lean towards that side of the spectrum. I'm pretty willing to talk about anything to this day. But in 2013, my boundaries started to shift. So are any of you guys familiar with Brene Brown? A few of you? OK. So she did a TED Talk on vulnerability. And this TED Talk changed my life. And then I read her book, Daring Greatly. Have any of you guys read this book? Yeah? OK, this book is a game changer. I think that every, per every creative entrepreneur, especially if you're publishing content and sharing online, should read this book. So who hasn't read this book? OK, a few of you. Who would like to read this book? OK, it's yours. Because I also happen to re be reading the um, Japanese art of tidying up. Is anyone reading that one? Yeah, and so I'm like totally decluttering. I'm on like the declutter train and I have a few extra copies. So yeah, it's all yours. <laughs> Read it, write a review, and tweet at Brene because that's exactly what I did. And um, I tweeted at her. I said, your book has changed my life. I also put the review in Amazon. And she tweeted back at me. And you guys, this is a hero of mine. I was so excited. And so then I almost threw up whenever a month later I saw her name in my email inbox. Once I had published my book review, she noticed what I did for a living, which was branding for creative entrepreneurs. So she emails me and says, I have to go on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday in about a month. Can you help me overhaul my personal brand and get a new website up by the time that goes live? <laughs> I was like, okay, Oprah. I feel you. So I did. I agreed. I said yes. Um, now, we were working on our site together, and there were just like a few little revisions and back and forth. And so I said, how about I just fly down and we work together on this side by side? So I flew down to Houston, Texas, where Brene lives. And here I am sitting on her couch with her, and we are working on her website. And I am overcome with like cold chills. I'm getting goosebumps, I'm starting to sweat. You know whenever you get that like, you start salivating towards the back of your mouth and you're like, I'm definitely going to barf. <laughs> that started happening. I was like, okay, I'm definitely going to throw up. And it wasn't because I was nervous about designing my hero's website before she goes on Oprah. It's because I was 10 weeks pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> and. And as I was leaving, I thought, why not ask the expert on the topic of sharing and being vulnerable how I start to write about this new experience? Because my boundaries were shifting. And she told me this. She said, well, she told me two things. The first was, write for your fans and not for your critics. And the second was, share what is vulnerable and not what is intimate. And I go, well, how do I know? Like, what's the difference? And she said, you're going to have to hit up against that line and maybe even cross it from time to time to know where your line is. And so on my flight home from Houston, Texas, I drew a line down a piece of paper. And on the left side, I wrote vulnerable. And on the right side, I wrote intimate. And I just started brainstorming out what I was and was not willing to talk about. And this line is constantly changing. And it's a thin one. 
Okay, so whenever I'm feeling really freaked out or discouraged or like I have nothing to say, I like to consult my board of directors. So I would like to introduce you all to performer, entertainer. You might know her by the name of Beyonce. Comedian, actress, and television producer, Amy Poehler. We have Wes Anderson, who is the director of films such as The Darjeeling Limited, The Royal Tenenbaums, Moonrise Kingdom. He has such an eye for symmetry and quirky detail and color. So inspiring to me. I like leave his films crying because of the art direction. And then we have scientist and host of Star Talk and Cosmos host and just general teddy bear, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So whenever I'm feeling really shaken up, I invite my board of directors over for dinner. Now, it's still not a big deal, so obviously these people are not actually coming over for dinner, but I can pretend, and so can you. So here's how this works. I'll invite these people over for dinner, and I'll ask them, okay, I'm thinking about talking about this thing, but I'm really freaked out. How should I go about it? And I will think about how they share their work. I will think about the kind of values they embody that inspire me. And I will think about how they show up and I will draw on this courage and find really interesting ways to share the content that is scary to me or find ways to get inspired whenever I'm feeling, not, I'm feeling nothing at all and need to hit publish on something at all. So that's something that you guys can do as well. So think about who you would want to invite over for dinner. <laughs> It can be four to six people, more or less. Whatever. Like sometimes I'm like, I just need Beyonce. I, no one else needs to come over but Beyonce. Um, and think about what they value, what they're wearing, how they're capturing and shaping and sharing their experiences, and how that can inform a little bit of what you're doing too. Okay, so you might be like, rewind. How did you get a big deal client like Brene Brown? And I'm going to tell you how I've done that and how I've also gotten other really big deal opportunities and partnerships. But first, let me tell you about my podcast. So by showing up and blogging all the time, I had made friends with Emily Thompson. And she's what I would call a business bestie. I was doing branding and she was doing web development. And once a month, we would get together over Skype and start talking shop. We would be talking about what was working in our businesses and what wasn't. And after years of collaborating, there was even like one failed workshop. We wanted to have like an in-person workshop and one person signed up, so we called it quits. But years even after that, she sent me an email and she said, I think we need to start a podcast and here's why. And she pitched me with this like bulleted list and we had already been working so well together that it was a no-brainer. I said yes. And that podcast is called Being Boss, and it's where we share advice and tactics and tips for creative entrepreneurs. Now, unlike my blog, that never really became a big deal, I never got sponsors, and I never felt like I could show up to those conferences and be like, oh, I'm Kathleen Shannon. The podcast did become a big deal. And we were getting rock star interviews, really cool partnerships. And the way we did that, the, the approach has always been the same. And that is, one, by sharing really useful content. Whenever anyone asks me, how do I grow my business or my audience or my traffic, it always comes back to content first. And if you're not thinking about your content first and writing something that's really useful and honest and helpful, then everything, nothing else really matters. So content first. Second is that I keep it real with my listeners and my audience 100% of the time. I try and be who I am 100% of the time. Now, note on that, it is always evolving. Who I am every single day is evolving and changing. And so keeping it real can look a little different every single day. Sometimes I change my mind. And sometimes it's through publishing my content itself that I start to shape who I become. So, the third thing is 
I give it all away for free. I try to never hoard my ideas or my knowledge or my experience or my expertise. I try and share everything I know in the most valuable way possible every single day. Now, a lot of people ask, I'm just gonna clarify real quick, because sometimes people ask, what does that mean to give it all away for free? Does this mean that I'm going to work for sponsors for free? Or I'm, am I going to design some logos for free? That's not it at all. It's just that in the content that you're sharing, being really honest and useful, and sharing the stuff where you're like, maybe I should keep this a secret. Because that's what's going to position you as an expert. And whenever you can do it in your real voice, that's what's going to position you as a relatable and likable authority. Okay, so back to the podcast and the opportunities that we have gotten, and including um, rock stars like Brene Brown and the sponsor opportunities that we've had, all start with a list. So tip number two in getting more traffic, more audience, getting bigger opportunities, better partnerships and collaborations is to make a list. Now, are you guys familiar with a shit list? Like that's like your list of people that have wronged you and you're like, you will never be coming over for dinner. Well, I like to make a hot shit list. So it's the opposite and it's the people that I admire and adore and just think are the bomb. So everyone from individuals, obviously everyone on my dinner party is on my list, um, to brands, to my neighbor down the street, like anybody can be on this list. And I'll show you exactly what my list looks like. Here's how it works. I like to make a list of 200 people. Now, you can do this in like a fancy software platform like Contactually or another kind of CRM, which I don't even know what that stands for. Client, I don't even know. But <laughs> my, my co-host, who's more techie than I am, she's like, oh, that's a CRM. And I'm like, can we just get out a spreadsheet or like a piece of paper? So I do like to go kind of low tech with my hot shit list and just write a list of 200 people. Now, on my list, I like to put contact info. So this might be their Instagram handle. It might be their email. And then sometimes on this second contact list, I will put a friend that we have in common. Um, so someone that can make an introduction. Then I put social, email, and interaction. And these are this, this could really be anything, but it might be that I tweeted at them and I'll note the date of it. It might be that I signed up for their newsletter list and hit respond on their very first autoresponder, just saying, hey, love what you're doing, no need to response, or no need to respond, just wanted to say hey. And I might make note of what the interaction was. So every single person that I've had the opportunity to interview from Marie Forleo to Melissa Hartwig of the Whole30 to clients like Brene Brown um, to sponsors like FreshBooks, they have all been on my hot shit list. In fact, um, when I first started the podcast, I was like, okay, let's, let's like finally make some money doing this thing. Let's get some sponsors. And we started our list, and I wrote down Adobe Creative Suite, because it's a program I use all the time. And then I wrote down FreshBooks Cloud Accounting, because again, it's a program that I use all the time. And then I got tired. I was like, I, I'm too exhausted thinking about monetizing my content. Let's just go record something. So I put the list aside. I had two people on it, and my goal was 200. But I had two potential sponsors on it. And by seven episodes in, FreshBooks contacted us. Now, I don't know if there was some magic from like writing it down on the list or if writing it down on the list caused me to maybe name drop them a little bit more in some of those first episodes and then they caught wind of it. But either way, whenever you make a list, it's going to subtly shift how you write your content or how you reach out to the people that you want to work with. And it takes time. Like, there are still people, I, I, I'm still waiting on Oprah. So it's not like this is total magic, but I have no, and Beyonce. Though, okay, this is the other thing about the list, is that um, someone, like, kind of whispered in my ear that they were Beyonce's designer. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> so because I have this list, I was able to make note I now know Beyonce's designer. So just like getting one step closer. Okay, so make a list. <laughs> All right, here is the other way that I've been able to get some really cool opportunities and even clients. Five years ago, I started my business, Braid Creative, with my sister. 
And we spent months designing our website, getting our business plan in order, figuring out what we wanted to do and who we were going to work with and how we were going to market to them and target them. And at the time, um, I had quit my day job in advertising. I had been out for a year. My sister had been working as a creative director in advertising for almost 15 years. So it was a really big deal. We don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. We're the first of everyone. Like everyone's freaking out for us too. My mom and dad are like, what are you doing? Could you get some benefits? <laughs> like it always comes back down to the benefits. And to note, like our brother is a sideshow performer who literally swallows swords and hammers nails into like his nose for a living. So I was like, I feel like our branding company is gonna do just fine. <laughs> but we had launched and it was in our first week, and then the second week went by, and I felt like it was crickets chirping. You know that feeling of being so excited about something, and then no response. People were excited for us, sure, but we needed some clients. So we were working with an executive coach at the time. His name is Jay Pryor, and he's a little woo-woo, and he goes, you've got to make space for those clients. And I was like, we've got nothing but space for clients. And he was like, no, the universe abhors a vacuum. You need to make space. I was like, I need you to like tell me what you're talking about. He was like, okay, get a poster board and draw some blank spots on it. And those blank spots are for your clients. So I was working from my home office and I look up and I have this huge chalkboard wall that I had painted that I had been using for like my outfit photos. So I went up to that huge chalkboard and I got a piece of chalk and I drew 10 huge empty spaces. I swear, a week later I had filled up all 10 of those spots. So this is what was the beginning of the chalkboard method. Um, and tip number three, make space for what you want. Write that down. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how it works. <laughs> all right, so this was the beginning of the chalkboard method. You can look this up, if, um, but I'm going to tell you more about it. Okay, so the chalkboard method, it started with that one wall of 10 spots that I drew. And I filled those 10 spots, but it wasn't necessarily with dream clients. So I come back to my coach, and I'm like, yeah, I had a meeting last week with a used car salesman, and it felt real shady. Like, there was nothing about that. I, I did kind of get cold sweats and the saliva thing happening in that meeting, and it was not because I was pregnant. Like, I really thought, have you guys ever seen that episode of Sopranos? Or Adriana just... <laughs> okay, I really thought I was just going to puke, but um, I didn't. But I went back knowing, like, okay, I needed to be dream clients. Like, I'm not going to just sell out to anyone who happens to have cash who can hire me. So I asked my coach about this. I go, what do I do? And he goes, you need a mantra. And I was like, of course I need a mantra. So my mantra became, I am attracting dream clients with cash. And I even drew, you can see it on there, a little magnet with a Cupid's arrow through it. And I swear to God, it worked. <laughs> So I started, and, and really what it did, okay, so here's the deal with the chalkboard, and you can use the chalkboard, and I think we, I included a worksheet of this in your conference PDF packet, so keep your eyes peeled for that, um, and that has all the instructions on it for how to create your own chalkboard, but I was using it to not only keep track of and make space for dream clients, I was also using it for special projects, like developing out an e-course. At one point, my podcast was on the chalkboard. I also use it to track social and like growing my social campaign numbers. And um, most recently on my chalkboard, I drew a little book in the corner. This was in November. I drew a little book in the corner because I felt like I'm, I'm ready to write a book. And two weeks later, I had an agent contact me who was interested in a a book for being boss. And so just yesterday, I signed the contract with Hachette. So they, they, <laughs> um, that'll be out this time next year. So it's a long process. It's so different from like being able to just write a blog and hit publish, which is what I'm used to. So anyway, here's the deal with the chalkboard is that 
I do believe that there's a little bit of magic in it, but on a very practical level, I think what it does is it makes you get really specific about your goals. So I drew that book on my chalkboard, but I also probably started talking about wanting to write a book. And then an agent who happens to listen to the podcast is like, well, I can help you write a book. So I think what it really does is it helps you get really specific about the goals that you want. And it keeps them really visual in front of mind. So I have a lot of people who ask me like, okay, okay, I get it. I get the chalkboard, but how do I fill it? And I'll say, have you actually done it? Have you done the chalkboard? Is it on your wall? And they're like, well, no, but I'm like, okay, first you have to actually do it. And that's what it is with all these tools. You have to actually do them. It's not enough to just know them. You have to do them. But again, I think that the chalkboard, it just makes your goals really visual, very specific, and front of mind. You're reminded of them every day. And so whenever I start to have those blank spaces, because there are months whenever I'm not filling those spaces. So it's not always like magic and puppies and rainbows and Oprah. It's like <laughs> sometimes there's blank spaces. And so I know I need to send out an email if I need to get that client. I need to launch the e-course if I want to get those ticks on my board. I need to actually post on my social media if I want to grow those numbers. So that's how the chalkboard works. And this is pretty much what you have in your packet along with instructions. So you can actually put this on a physical chalkboard, you can use a whiteboard, you can use a poster board, whatever you want to use. If you even look up like hashtag chalkboard method on Instagram, a lot of people have great ideas. There was one gal who was wanting to sell out a hundred of her programs and she painted a canvas with polka dots and every time she sold one of her programs, she filled in the polka dot with a solid color. So I thought that was a really cool, interesting way to make it visual and track it. Okay, so in closing, I think that there are three things that are going to help you get better opportunities, partnerships, collaborations, more traffic and audience and opportunity, I said opportunities twice, um, more, just more, better, bigger, is to make really honest content, to make that list, and to make space with your chalkboard. All right, so I wanted to leave plenty of time open for a conversation. That's what I'm used to these days. Um, and that's my favorite thing about getting to speak at conferences like this. And this is a small enough group that I think we have a few minutes in, in space for that conversation. So do you guys have any questions? I'm an open book. Do you want to know what deodorant works? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I really like the brand Soapwalla, but whenever I was pregnant, I had like an allergic reaction to it. So then, my friend at Flora Apothecary developed another very similar like cream-based deodorant that I really love. <laughs> but most recently, I discovered that if you drink two tablespoons of this like green stuff called chlorophyll every day, it works like a charm. I'm I, no joke. So chlorophyll, drinking it. I know it's crazy. I, it kind of does, but I think it's. <laughs> they make some that are minty. They make you can make like you can take swallowable pills. I haven't tried that yet. I'll try it and blog about it and let you know. <laughs> Do you guys have any other? Yeah. Okay, what is the most strategic investment I would recommend for a boss lady to make? Boss person. Boss person. Um, you know, I have, I have kind of two answers to this. Like one, I do have a team, I have a staff, and if I could go back and do it all over again, I have designers on my team, I would probably hire a virtual assistant first. So someone who can manage some of those daily tasks like literally uploading my blog post to the platform and formatting the photos and then maybe then loading that into the newsletter. And virtual assistants can really grow with you if you have the right person. And so mine has grown with me where she's now handling a lot of my social media and handling my schedule. So I, you, I, don't, I didn't hand off all the keys at once. It started with really simple tasks. And it, that can be a really inexpensive investment. Like an assistant can help you 
project by project basis. You can start really small, but I think that's a really great way to grow your team specifically and to stop doing the things that you don't like doing so much. Um, obviously, I'm going to say branding. I, <laughs> I think that being able to articulate who you are and who you're for and the why behind that and then having an identity that is that outer layer that reflects what people will get if they go a step deeper with you and, and want to invest in consuming your content and the time it takes to do that. I mean, I think that's the other thing with blogging and publishing content is that it's all starting to move so fast that we're not only competing with each other, we're competing with people's attention spans. So I think that really attractive branding can help let people know what to expect, not only in the identity, but in the positioning and messaging. Another investment that I think is really worthwhile is traveling to meet people and traveling to learn more. That has always paid off for me. And then finally, masterminding. So whether it's a paid mastermind group or getting together with your peers, um, having a business bestie. Again, that's more of a time investment than a cost investment, but I think it's one that is so worthwhile. Thinking about some of my earliest peers from six years ago when none of us were big deals and the way that we've been able to support each other and share secrets on what's working and what's not and just getting really honest about that has been invaluable. Good question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you need to put Tina Fey on there. I had Beyonce and Oprah on mine, and that was not a joke. Like, this is literally... <laughs> Okay, so I think that the point of the hot shit list is, it, and it could be simply that you put that person on your list and then they come out with a memoir and you're like, oh, I need to read that. That's someone I'm interested in. For me, more than anything, it's just reminding me of who I'm interested in and who I want to surround myself with. So have you guys ever heard that you are the five closest people that you surround yourself with? Um, I also recently, have you never, ever heard that? <laughs> yeah. Look at the five people that you surround yourself with the most. And that will start to say something. It, it totally could. It totally could. <laughs> um, but for me, and then I also recently heard that you only have capacity in your brain to really know 150 people at a time. So maybe it should be like the hot shit 150. Um, but writing down that list of names is just going to bring to the front of mind the people that you admire. It's kind of like the dinner party on a grander scale. And if those people do end up approaching you, because they're on your list, there's less decision making involved. That's how it's been for me. Like there's been less decision making involved in knowing who's on my list and whenever opportunities come up that get me either closer to that person or to the kind of values that that person conveys or further away from it, I can say yes or no. I feel like this is getting even more confusing. But essentially, the list of 200 people just reminds me of who I want to work with and who I want to connect with. And it reminds me to either sign up for their newsletter or read their memoir or to tweet at them or to in some way engage. And that's just been the way that I've been able to unlock a lot of really cool opportunities and partnerships. OK, just write a list of 200 people and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Are your That's a really good question. What are you blogging about right now? <laughs> and then what do you Oh, so you don't want to shift from blogging to podcasting. You want to shift from blogging to photography. I think that if it's still centered around the same theme, to go ahead and keep it together. There might be enough brand equity. And something that surprised me with my personal blog, whenever I went from personal blogging to starting that business with my sister, I was surprised with how many people followed me over. And I 
I had a small platform in comparison to a lot of my peers, but I had a really loyal one. And I could not believe that they were hiring me. It was kind of shocking. And so I think leveraging the platform and the brand equity that you already have and what you've created is a really great idea, especially if it's related. For me, everything was still intertwined because it's all been about capturing and shaping and sharing and being blending who you are into the work that you do with personal branding. So I built my personal brand with my personal blog. I started getting hired for personal branding through Braid Creative. And then I started talking about it on being boss. So they are all under three separate brands, mostly because I have different partners in each one. So that was kind of more of a logistical thing. And I do think that the brand being boss really helped leverage that into the space that it is. It was almost, you know, if I, if I had branded that under the braid name or even just my own name, I don't think it would have been as successful as it has been. So those are some of the considerations that you might think about, but I'm I always want to urge people to keep it together because the more you start to fracture and separate your brands and businesses, the more spread thin you're going to start to feel. Yeah. Does your shit list include companies? Hot shit list, just to be clear. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah, my hot shit list does include companies. So I had started that one specifically on sponsors, but now I just blend it all together. So it might include companies, it might include brands or other podcasts or media outlets. Yep, I combine it all together. Yeah. Yeah, so I had a coach because my sister had started working with an executive coach that her company had hired for their team, um, like for their management level team. And her CEO at this advertising agency saw that she was becoming increasingly unhappy at her job. And so he had started working with a coach and so he was like, you should work with him. And so we started working with her coach whenever she left because it was an exchange for branding actually. And so he needed some branding, we needed some coaching, and some of the things that we talked about with him was really just how do we make this transition from working day jobs to working for ourselves and not freak out about it. So that's the kind of stuff that I was really talking to him about most of the time, is like not freaking out and really getting specific about what it was that we wanted to create together. And so there was like kind of a cool personal professional blend with the coach that I used where we were talking about business, we were talking about it wasn't a business coach by any means. It was more of like the emotional support within the context of business. But since then, I have hired different kinds of coaches. So I've worked with a, um, like a postpartum, I call her my mama coach. And so like, what's happening to my body? And how do I like get my stomach back together and stuff like that. And um, I've also worked with a business coach and she helped me figure out how to monetize being boss. And so that was very specific, and I can talk to her about things like marketing tactics or um, sales funnels or growing a newsletter list. So you can hire different coaches for different things. Yeah. Okay, so my business bestie, we hired each other. And I feel like that was really, um, really helpful in seeing each other's work style and seeing what we could bring to the table. So she had hired me for branding. I had hired her to help me with my web development and to develop my e-course and get that into an online platform. And so that has been, like probably the people that I've gotten closest to are the people that I've actually worked with or collaborated with on a project. So that's whenever we were working together, we were like, hey, do you wanna have a call? It was very organic. And even now, I'm trying to think of a couple of people that I've set up calls with. It usually might start for me with featuring them on my podcast. So that could also work in blogs. Like, hey, I want to feature you. And it, it's kind of this cool gateway if you already have a blog where you're 
might, might be able to have a feature on it. It's kind of a cool little gateway to get to know someone a little bit better. And it's just like any other relationship where there's chemistry involved and it can't be forced and it can grow over time. So my relationship with my podcast co-host, Emily, did, did, didn't start out with us being best friends. In fact, we weren't even as close as we are now until starting the podcast together. So I hope that that helps. I think that also maybe um, joining Facebook groups and masterminds where you see someone else showing up in the same way that you want to show up or in the same way that you're showing up can be another really great way to find your business bestie. And people that you just admire. Like it could even be someone whose blog you're constantly like, yes, and sending them an email saying, hey, would you like to have a Skype date? And then take it from there, see what happens.